LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is James Howard Kunstler, who joins us to discuss some of the issues raised in his books, The Long Emergency, 2005, and Too Much Magic, published in 2013, examining how the global crises in energy, the economy, and the environment have unfolded in the interim. The last 200 years have seen the greatest explosion of progress and wealth in the history of mankind, but the age of oil that fueled this expansion is rapidly coming to an end. The depletion of fossil fuels is about to transform life as we know it, and do so much sooner than we think. Kunstler explains what to expect after we pass the tipping point of peak oil production, setting out to prepare us for economic, political and social changes on an unimaginable scale. Hello and welcome James and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, James, today we're going to be discussing a big topic for me here, uh, the three E's, so-called environment, energy, economy, all of which, plain to see, anybody who looks, are in a profound state of crisis. Uh, You're particularly known for uh, your 2005 book, The Long Emergency. Um, But before we dive into talking about all of this, tell listeners a little bit about your background, uh, how you became concerned with you know the so-called three e's and then if you could perhaps in in opening reflect on what has changed in the intervening years since that book was published that is to say some things that have happened faster than you thought they would maybe some things have happened slower some things you expected to happen didn't happen other things you didn't see have happened just you know tell us where you think we are with all of this well i started out as a newspaper reporter in the 1970s And uh, I had literary ambitions, and the program at the time for that sort of personality was to write novels. So I dropped out of journalism in the mid-70s and uh, wrote novels. And uh, I returned to journalism uh, in the late 1990s um, after having published eight eight books. When When I was a young newspaper reporter in the USA, I covered the 1973 OPEC oil embargo, and it made a big impression on me. Uh, At the time, I was working for a newspaper in the capital of New York State, Albany, New York, and they had just established a new office uh, at the end of this gigantic, heroic boulevard of uh, chain store commerce. And uh, so we were out there in this uh, suburban asteroid belt, And uh, it was, uh, uh, you couldn't fail to notice how the living arrangement and the working arrangement of things uh, in the USA was affected by these these oil shocks. And so as time went on, um, by and by, I decided to write a nonfiction book. After writing several novels, I decided to write a book about the fiasco of suburbia. And that was published in 1993 uh, under the title The Geography of Nowhere. And it was a it was a kind of a minor hit in the uh, uh, in the graduate schools and the architecture schools, because there there weren't that many uh, readable books about this issue. Anyway, um, the idea in that book was that we had evolved a living arrangement in the USA with very poor prospects for carrying on into the future. And um, I wrote a few more books about urban design and and, uh, cities uh, in that vein because I had become involved with a reform movement called the New Urbanists. And uh, 
these were people who were inspired by uh, the likes of uh, Leon Creer and uh, Christopher Alexander. And uh, the whole idea was, you know, to build a better human habitat uh, in the uh, USA. Well, uh, some, some things happened uh, in the mid-90s that uh, kind of changed the picture. And, and uh, the, main one, the main one was that a cohort of senior geologists retired from the oil industry and started publishing their private dark thoughts about where the oil uh, age was headed. And these were guys like Colin Campbell, who I believe was the chief geologist for Total, uh, and um, Jean Le Herrera from France, who was the chief ge geologist of uh, one of their top oil companies. And these uh, uh, papers were published in obscure journals. So they didn't get a whole lot of uh, attention in the public. But at the same time, this other phenomenon was rising, and that was the Internet. And um, this information uh, uh, began to leak out into the Internet, and people began to see what the geologists themselves, the eminent geologists, were thinking about the future of the oil industry. And the picture was pretty dark. They were... Uh, uh, predicting that we would get into trouble with our oil supply in the early 21st century. And so that prompted me to, uh, to look into the, the, you know, you couldn't fail to notice this anyway back in the 1970s that, that uh, uh, in the USA anyway, that the, the, the whole picture of car dependency um, and the, uh, the long supply lines for our petroleum supply uh, were so fragile that sooner or later we were going to get into trouble uh, just uh, uh, fueling the, this uh, operation. So this was sort of confirmed in the mid-1990s by these chaps uh, in Europe. And um, meanwhile, there had been uh, a, a, an eminent geologist in the USA named M. King Hubbard, who uh, had been warning the American oil industry since the 1950s that, uh, you know, he had developed a model for predicting what the, uh, the rise and, and uh, uh, fall of the oil industry would be. This came to be known as Hubbard's Curve. And, um, you know, the American public and American leaders and the industry itself really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to him. But of course, uh, as we entered the 21st century, this story began to play out. And we could see very clearly what the effect of uh, being in the twilight of the, uh, of the oil industry w was going to be like. And uh, so, we, you know, I wrote that book, the, the Long Emergency, in the early 2000s, came out in 2005. And uh, shortly, we were in, a, uh, you know, in another crisis. And uh, this time, the crisis really kind of comprehensively uh, damaged the entire economy and, and, in particular, the banking system and, and the, the financial sector um, for reasons that we can talk about, because um, the financial sector is um, completely dependent on the energy supply and the the energy sector. Well, as I mentioned at the top, um, I'd be interested to know what you your analysis of the intervening years. You know, as I say, what has happened that you expected to, uh, maybe some things that you didn't foresee, and in terms of the pace of breakdown and crisis. You know, some things maybe are moving faster than you anticipated. Mm -hmm. Maybe some things you know are, are have stabilized in ways you didn't expect. We certainly didn't uh, anticipate that the shale oil industry would ramp up to the extent that it did, but uh, I maintain that it, it had that uh, the sh the shale oil phenomenon has a largely illusory uh, uh, character, and uh, it, the shale oil was we didn't know exactly how we were going to uh, exploit this resource with the, what the so-called tight oil in the, in the uh, impermeable shale rock. 
Um, we developed some techniques for blasting it out. It turns out they're very expensive. It turns out that the shale oil industry has never made a profit in America. In fact, it's hemorrhaging money. Um, but it did a good job of demonstrating that you could get oil out of tight rock. The trouble is we can't get it out at a, uh, uh, at a cost that we can afford. And um, so my guess is that what will happen is that uh, because the problems with the expensive oil lead directly to the impairment of capital formation, uh, the, the implication is that there will probably be a lot less capital in the future for continuing the incessant drilling operations that are required by shale oil because the wells deplete so rapidly, um, you know, they, uh, they're really uh, done after, after three years and, and they decline by at least half uh, in their first year. Uh, it's necessary to, to keep on drilling incessantly and that requires an enormous amount of uh, constant streams of capital and most of that capital is borrowed. So, um, you know, as they discover that these companies engaged in this really can't pay that capital back because they're not making a profit, I think we're going to see the shale oil industry really disappear probably in the next 24 months. But we certainly didn't anticipate it and it has managed to sustain the illusion that we can keep on driving to the Walmart forever in America. Um, I emphasize that it's an illusion. A at the same time, uh, the financial system, uh, in particular the central banks, and in particular the, the Federal Reserve Central Bank of the USA, uh, developed a set of gimmicks that allowed us to pretend that the banking system still worked. And this basically had to do with creating a lot of money out of thin air, uh, electronically, digital, gi digitally, and um, pretending to prop up insolvent banks and keep the system going. So we've been we've been managing to do that for the last uh, uh, six or seven years. But I think the truth of the matter is that the uh, the banking system is is perhaps fatally damaged. The functions of the financial markets have been perhaps fatally compromised because the, the interventions and actions of the central banks have destroyed the main function of financial markets, which is called price discovery. And price discovery means that you, you know, very simply that you can establish the value and the price of virtually, you know, everything that is a financial commodity whether it's a, a stock in a company or the value of a, of a house or a, uh, an ounce of gold or anything. So these interventions have, um, are in the process of uh, impairing uh, the banking system and the financial markets to the degree that you know, they're going to stop working sooner or later. They're already um, uh, doing very perverse things but we've been able to pretend that they're okay. So uh, the financial system being the most fragile of all the major systems that we depend on for everyday life, um, it seems to be the case that the failure of the financial system will be the first really big thing that leads us into this long emergency. Two things uh, just briefly regarding the, the shield oil thing. Uh, one is the question of net energy, which I don't think, you know, most people don't have any idea of the importance of that. And second, with regard to the financial aspect, we're seeing record high stock prices at the moment, which is, you know, just doesn't make any sense regarding, you know, the sentiment seems to be so positive regarding so many things, which is a complete contradiction to all the things that we're, we're talking about. And in that light, shale oil is just another bubble, really, waiting to burst. Yeah, they're all really bubbles in one way or another. Uh, there's, there, you know, there is a certain amount of capital that's still sloshing around in the world, and particularly the West and the USA. You know, that represents the massive acquired wealth of the industrial age. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of miscegenated with a lot of pretend wealth and a lot of fraudulent wealth and a lot of fraudulent paper pretending that it's wealth and a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, digital money that's not real. Um, uh, the the ultra low interest rate policy of the central banks has really made it necessary for the large institutional investors to to rush into the stock markets because they can't really make any money that you know they need to make uh, you know five six seven eight percent a year in order to pay out their pensions um, and, and to uh, you know con- to rationalize their operations in uh, in the sense of insurance companies let's say. But these institutional investors uh, cannot make money in, uh, you know, safe, secure uh, bonds. So they're rushing out of those into the uh, stock market. And and there's a lot of uh, frightened money from, uh, you know, from China, from 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 uh, Europe that's rushing into the uh, American stock market. And um, the inflation or, or bubble nature of the stock markets right now are just another function of the failure of price discovery because what it really means is that these price these, these stocks are mispriced you know everything's mispriced right now um, because the 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 markets have really been disabled so you know when you when you do something as fundamental as misprice the basic interest rates you know the cost of money the cost of borrowing money that thunders through the system and it starts to disturb the your ability to determine the price of anything. Just before I called you today, I was listening to the news here in the UK and with regards to interest rates, um, I, I just heard this comment. This guy said the newsreader was talking to interviewing some, you know, talking head or other. He was saying, oh, I see that the uh, Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee have decided to keep interest rates uh, uh, where they are at record lows, and they've been there for months and months and months. And I was like, "What you mean, six years?" <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this is an experiment that's never been tried before. But you know, at the same time, the industrial age is an experiment that's never been tried before. And like most things in in reality, uh, you know, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It, it's not a perpetual motion machine. And uh, because it because the industrial experience with such a just a gigantic enterprise you know it, it's coming to a rather gigantic and and disturbingly uh, 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 destructive climax um, I, I do think I, I need to mention that um, in the intervening years after I wrote the long emergency I wrote a number of books but uh, the nonfiction book that I wrote was was a response my own response to what was going on it's called too much magic, and the subtitle was "Wishful Thinking, Technology, and the Fate of the Nation." And uh, the reason I wrote it was because you could see very clearly after after 2008, especially after the uh, uh, the fall of Lehman Brothers and the uh, the financial crash in the USA, um, you could see that we had entered this this uh, period of tremendous wishful thinking that uh, the, the, the American public and our leaders in, 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 in everything, in business, government, academia, really uh, everywhere, our leaders wanted to put over a story that everything was okay and that technology would allow us to uh, keep on running an industrial economy forever and that there was nothing to worry about. So, uh, you know, we... We, in, we vested all of our hopes that uh, shale oil would make us the next Saudi Arabia and make us energy independent. None of that is true, of course, uh, and that you know we would find some technological workaround for running all the cars, because another theme of uh, the wishful thinking meme is that we're going to that everybody will shift to electric cars uh, and uh, you know we'll, we'll be just fine. Um, and so th- you know, th- this wishful thinking was really a, a, a striking feature of the moment. And I wanted to write a book about it. And um, w- I think we're still in that phase, although we're beginning probably to shake out of it. You know, the world is really starting to shake, rattle and roll and fly apart right now, especially geopolitically. And I think pretty soon uh, America is going to enter a new mood and uh, it's going to be uh, different. It's probably going to be characterized more by desperation, 
and in, in particular political desperation. Uh, but we're, we're going to leave the wishful thinking phase behind and, and enter the extreme paranoia uh, phase. Yeah, I'm going to title this talk actually Too Much Magic because that's your most up-to-date kind of summation of where we are. Basically, as you say, that the 2008 crash wasn't just a, another blip. It's actually the beginning of the end of something. That, that vision of post-war optimism, you know, with future filled with microwaves and televisions for everyone and fa- two-car families and eventually domed cities and holidays on the moon, all of that sort of stuff was only ever science fiction. Yeah, well, and, and it's still funny that, uh, you know, we're still talking about uh, going to other planets and we're doing a very poor job of inhabiting this one. Yeah, I must admit, as, as fascinated as I've been all my life with astronomy and the possibility of space travel, it does seem kind of delusional thinking that you hear from those sort of circles. But I think the facts on the ground kind of speak to the truth. And that's where what NASA are up to. They seem to be compiling all sorts of reports on the state of mankind. I don't see them doing too much work on getting to Mars or anything like that. And uh, you look at, um, you know, what was it, Obama cancelled the, uh, the oh, I can't remember what it was called, the name of the so-called mission to return to the moon. And the reason he gave was because, well, we've already been there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, been there and done that. Yeah. So it's like as if it, as if we could go back to the moon that we wouldn't do that. Of course we would. You know, who wouldn't like to see a return to the moon? But uh, But no, you know. Well, it's just really kind of a stunt, you know, just like the the kind of stunts that that we see, the kind of art stunts that we now see in all the major art museums of the world. You know, we we become kind of a a, a stunt throwing uh, culture. We you know we we seem to want to impress ourselves, um, and you know we're drinking our own Kool Aid and believing our own public relations and believing our own stories. You know, right now what's going on in America. The, which probably fascinates me the most is is just the extent to which we become a culture of dishonesty. You know, we're we're just not able to tell ourselves the truth about anything. As a one-time would-be architect, I took particular interest in your book, The Geography of Nowhere, which was published quite some time ago. Uh, subtitle of that was Rise and Decline of America's Man-Made Landscape. And one of the aspects of this sort of unwinding that we're seeing is the the unsuitability, as you mentioned earlier, of the built environment to cope with the sort of future that we've got. And I know that there's a quite a striking contrast between the US and Europe in this regard. Of course, you can't just treat Europe as one homogenous mass, but it does seem that the old what remains of the old cities of Europe will be somewhat better able to cope with the decline of the petroleum age, whereas a lot of U.S. infrastructure is entirely designed, again, as this post-war boom, entirely designed around uh, the motor car. Yeah, you know, when I go around and do these university lectures, I have to remind the students that life is tragic. You know, uh, that used to be a regular module of a liberal education in America, but they they managed to to take it out over the last 20 years. It's not there anymore. So it comes as a great surprise to the students when I say life is tragic. And by that, I don't mean that everything has a bad ending. Uh, I don't mean that at all. What I mean is that, uh, you know, uh, there are consequences to the decisions and the choices that we make. And we made a lot of bad choices in America, and now we're faced with uh, what Robert Louis Stevenson called the banquet of consequence. And uh, you know, the the main one for the for the moment being that we uh, we built a living arrangement with no future. That is the main characteristic of American suburbia. It's a living arrangement with no future, and um, you know, it 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 uh, has it has some. That has some other implications, but um, the w- one of the great uh, one of the other great tragedies of of the early 21st century is that we uh, tried to base the American economy on the building of more and more suburbia, and that that's what the housing boom was all about. That's what the bubble was all about: was building more uh, stuff that had no future. And now we're stuck with it. And, uh, you know, it has very poor prospects. And uh, unfortunately, we managed to destroy our cities in the process, except for, uh, let's say, New York, Boston, Washington, 
you know, and, and a handful of other places. But we also made some bad decisions in our cities. For example, it, you know, it's my belief that the cities that are overburdened with skyscrapers are getting are, are going to get into a lot of trouble. And in the USA, that mostly means New York City and it mostly means Manhattan. And I think what we're going to discover is that the skyscraper is an obsolete building form and that uh, uh, they have to be regarded as liabilities, not as assets. And it's not because of the heating or air conditioning or running the air, uh, the, the elevators per se. It, it's a much deeper problem, which is that these buildings will never be renovated. Uh, we're not going to be in the same economy that allowed them to be built in the first place. And the capital for renovating them will not be there. And probably the modular building materials will not be there. You know, even things as, uh, as mundane as uh, the gypsum board, the sheetrock that, that, you know, has to be changed out periodically in buildings. And um, so, you know, we're going we're gonna to have these cities that uh, have buildings in them that can't be reused after one generation. And that's going to be a big problem. I think that the, you know, the uh, Europe, Europe made some fortunate choices uh, after the Second World War. And um, one of them was to not suburbanize and, and to not get rid of uh, the European city. And, not, and to not redevelop it, for the most part, at the gigantic scale, at least not at the center. So many European cities are still, are still scaled to uh, uh, a, a kind of economy that, uh, you know, may be more in line with the uh, resource realities and capital realities of the future. But, of course... You know, Europe also faces some extremely grave problems, especially with energy. And uh, I don't think there's any question that the big cities all over the world are going to have to contract and probably contract quite a bit. You know, in America, the process is going to be very, very uh, ugly, I think, especially uh, where New York City and Los Angeles and, you know, Washington uh, San Francisco, Boston are concerned, Chicago, you know, these cities are going to have to contract hugely. A lot of the other cities in America have already been through their, uh, you know, through one major cycle of disinvestment and, and shrinkage. The problem is they've shrunk, you know, the, the problem is that their centers are gone and, you know, they're just donuts with a hole in the middle. And what will have to happen in places like Detroit and Dayton, Ohio, uh, and St. Louis is that the centers will have to be re-inhabited. And the reason is that these cities occupy important geographical sites. You know, they're, they're located on uh, uh, inland waterways and uh, great lakes and harbors. And, and of course, you know, climate change will have something to, to say about uh, the, the configuration of our coastal cities. But in the USA, uh, as we enter this, uh, you know, this, this, this next economy, I think what we're going to see is that it, it will be much more internally focused and that uh, things like the inland waterways of America are going to be where the action is, if there is any action at all, and that, you know, the cities like St. Louis and Cincinnati and Pittsburgh are going to regain importance and they're going to have to redevelop at their centers, which are now kind of broken and empty. So I don't know. Uh, the, the USA, in some ways, may be, uh, you know, restarting with a clean slate at the center of town. But we've got all of this material around the cities that is really going to be hopeless. And, you know, unfortunately, most of it uh, has a, a, probably a pretty unhappy destiny as either ruins or salvage or slums. You know, I don't think that it's going to I don't think that uh, the American suburbs, for the most part, are going to be retooled or retrofitted very much. It's possible in some places, but for the most part, I think there'll be either ruins, salvage, or slums. With regard to um, skyscrapers, I would recommend that listeners go on to YouTube and search your name and uh, a talk that you did called Land of Cranes, which talks about what's going on in Dubai, 
which was spectacularly, uh, spectacular folly in my opinion. But with regard to um, the structure of U.S. cities, I've only been to the U.S. once. I flew into New Jersey, got a cab to Manhattan, just stayed there for a week. Now, that Manhattan was eminently walkable. In fact, if you lived in Manhattan, I think you'd be crazy to own a car. But that's not typical of a lot of U.S. cities. And I had a, a British friend, actually, who went to the U.S. once, and he was, it was a typical you know, U.S. suburb, um, and he was trying to walk from where he was staying into the city centre. And the cops actually apprehended him and wanted to know what he was doing. Oh, and he yeah. was sort of saying, well, I'm wa- walking into the city. And they were kind of like, oh, OK, that's pretty suspicious behavior. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, in, in, you know, many places out in the heartland, you know, like Dallas and Minneapolis and Wichita, you know, uh, the only people who are walking along the road are uh, the mentally ill or winos or <laughs> displaced persons. Um, a, a word about Manhattan, though. I, I grew up in the middle of New York City, which is Manhattan Island. And, uh, you know, I grew up there. Uh, I, I'm pretty familiar with it. I, I think what we're seeing with Manhattan is it, it is indeed walkable and uh, in many ways a, a wonderfully vibrant uh, town. And that's largely because the, you know, the the pattern uh, on the on the ground floor and, and where the buildings meet the sidewalk has really not been changed uh, despite the intrusion of the automobile. The, the problem with Manhattan, though, is that the scale of everything in it has gotten so colossal that, you know, it's really uh, it, it's really not going to work in, in the next economy. So despite the walkability of Manhattan, it's burdened with too many other problems that are going to create enormous difficulties, including the uh, the enormity of the infrastructure that's necessary to service all of these gigantic skyscrapers and apartment towers. You know, I, you know, it, it, it's a magical, marvelous construction and, and uh, you know, a place of amazement and a wonder of the world and a wonder of the time that it was built. But unfortunately, uh, it's not something that has very bright prospects. And I, I think New York in particular, uh, my hometown, is, is going to be in very sad shape in another 30 years. I'm a great fan of... The train network, which you mentioned, uh, unfortunately, it seems that the train network in the U.S. has been allowed to atrophy. Uh, that's something maybe needs to be redeveloped. But the question is, are you going to have the resources to redevelop it in future? And you also mentioned the inland waterways. Again, another important resource. Maybe that can be brought back into life. They, they are actually still OK. Uh, one of the features of American life that's rather strange is that um, the canal system uh, at least the the uh, the canal system between the Hudson River and the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River in New York State has been maintained immaculately um, for for decades, despite the fact that it isn't used a whole lot. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we'll be able to use the 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 inland waterways pretty well. Um, the railroads are another story, and and that part of that story is a too much magic uh, symptom. You know, we've been we've been blathering in the USA about uh, building a high speed rail network, and it's just never going to happen at this point. We missed the window of opportunity. Uh, Other nations were able to do that. You know, they built their systems in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, France and Spain and Germany, Uh, China uh, built a pretty good system in the uh, 90s and the the early 21st century century. But we missed the boat on that. Sorry for the mixed metaphor. Uh, The thing is, we have a marvelous conventional railroad system that is just lying out there rusting away in the rain. And it was once the envy of the world. And we're doing nothing to repair or maintain that. And, you know, that's the real tragedy, because we're we're desperately going to need a conventional railroad system Um, when when we really get into the uh, the twilight of happy motoring, we're going to have to remember this is a, a big uh, continental sized country here in the USA, and we're not going to be able to get around it if we don't have a conventional railroad system. And and um, the American public's not interested, and our politicians aren't interested, and uh, the uh, the one high speed line that even 
got into uh, uh, that even got budgeted and 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 began to be underway was a line between uh, Sacramento, California, and and Southern California. Uh, my guess is that that line will never be finished. It's barely been started, but probably will never get finished. And there are no other high-speed uh, rail lines in America under construction now. So, you know, we have to repair the conventional railroad system. We're not doing it. It's one of the dumber things that any uh, civilization has ever done or failed to do. And, uh, you know, it's tragic. It's one of the many tragedies that we're enduring here. Now, a uh, current proposal for the UK government is to build something called HS2, which simply is High Speed 2. And this is a real extension to the real network that's proposed to connect, come out from London, go, go up initially into the, uh, the Midlands of the UK, eventually to the north of England. And ultimately, the idea is to go into the south of Scotland. And this is planned to start construction in 2017, finish in 2032 that's 15 years it's going to take the government's costing for this is 43 billion independent costing for the program is 80 billion and you can be sure that nothing the government ever does comes in under budget it's always well over budget now we've been talking about trains i'm a great fan of the trains um, i actually sold my car in january i just use the trains now uh -huh. but i think that this program uh the, this uk one is actually folly I think it will be a, a huge mistake to spend all that money. One of the proposed benefits, for example, is it's going to, if you're living in the north of England, instead of taking two and a half hours to get to London, it would take two hours. I don't think that's a good use of the money. And what I think all of this smacks of is growthism, because they're talking about, oh, think of the jobs, think about the economic growth. And this brings us on to something else I want to talk about, is this perpetual growth paradigm that we struggle under. And we you know we have a debt-based economy that depends on it. But... It's becoming manifestly clear, not just in the banking system, that we can't just grow forever, no matter what our economic system demands. Yeah, well, uh, I, I think that you're probably seeing a similar kind of folly in the UK that we have here in the US. And uh, uh, the UK uh, did quite a bit to dismantle its own railroad system in the late 20th century. And you had a real good railroad system before that. And, uh, you know, you've You've taken it apart, and and uh, uh, you'd be much better off just spending money to to uh, repair and replace the original uh, railroad system. It's just you know, especially considering the fact that your country is just not that geographically huge. And and I I couldn't agree more. What what's the point of spending uh, you know uh, eighty billion pounds just to shave a half an hour off of the trip from from London to Manchester. Exactly, exactly. In terms of the uh, of, of this growth paradigm, uh, we have this enormous problem now of money becoming decoupled from resources. And you talked about this yeah. at the start of the talk. And what I've wondered is, and we, all this quantitative easing that's been going on, and of course that hasn't trickled down, that's gone straight into banks and then straight into financial markets, all the bubbles we talk about. Can this be unwound i suspect the answer is no but can any of this be unwound without having real damaging effects in the real world you know because it's so much of this theoretical money and, and other financial instruments uh, one person could look at it perhaps not knowing the details of the system and say well you know this debt is owed to who and it's owed to mega banks and well can't we just write it off it's all exists on a computer screen just press delete but <laughs> I, I suspect that it's not good it's not really that simple no, I, I, I think it would have uh, extremely damaging consequences. And, and uh, you know, the pro there are a number of problems here. The One, one of them is, is that the institutions involved, uh, in, particularly, in, in particular the Federal Reserve Bank in the USA, has managed to hide so many of the, the debts and so much of the bad paper and so much of the fraud. And, uh, you know, really what, what we're dealing with is a tremendous amount of fraud of things purporting to be something that they're not, mainly things of value, mainly papers that represent value or, or digital claims uh, that, that represent value. And uh, uh, so th 
they won't even permit the debt to be unwound. And uh, it seems that the path that they've chosen is to, to attempt to inflate it away as carefully as possible. But uh, we all know that, uh, you know, the central bankers appear to think that they have their hands on some giant dial that, you know, where they can just dial up uh, these conditions like the the interest rates or, you know, just jigger one thing or another or just, uh, you know, perform one ma magic intervention in a market after another and they can keep this process uh, going. But I think what will happen eventually is that, uh, you know, the creation of, uh, of money out of thin air will finally get away from them and we'll find ourselves in a dangerous kind of inflation. And, and uh, if we actually did allow the debt to be written off, we would find ourselves in a probably very uh, destructive deflationary situation. And the difference is really, you know, between deflation and inflation is that in deflation, nobody has any money. Money disappears. Uh, money isn't around anymore because uh, because money in our system is debt or, or, or money is created out of debt. And when the debts can't be repaid, the money disappears. So uh, uh, in a deflation, nobody has any money. In an inflation, uh, everybody has plenty of money, but the money is worthless. So either way, you're broke. And uh, what, we're, what we're ultimately faced with is the fact that we have a society that has less wealth than it thought it had. And um, what, what complicates things is that we're entering a situation now where we desperately need to, to continually roll over debt and create new debt and, and you know, extend new credit. And we can't do that anymore. Because one of the uh, unfortunate conditions of reaching the limits of an energy resource is that uh, uh, this, this kind of economy needs continuous growth of, uh, of energy resources in order to allow the continuous growth of debt and credit. And, and so when that uh, amount of energy uh, resource input stops growing, then your ability to uh, uh, generate new debt, uh, you lose the ability to generate new debt. You can no longer service the old debt. And um, uh, you're really uh, kind of trapped. And that's the predicament that the central banks find themselves in now. Now, this coming to the end of an energy resource um, overlaps uh, very much with <laughs> Uh, what's physically happening on the planet, you know, with regards to climate, but also, you know, physical resources. It's not you know, beyond simply um, oil and you know, and other fossil fuels. There's no life without water. It, it, the, this growth paradigm that I've talked about has been putting tremendous strains on lots of other natural resources. And I think that uh, whether it's tied into climate effects or not, I think some of the water shortages and problems that we're seeing there are one of the things I think is going to be is going to bite most. It's going to be one of those things that will impact people's lives and wake them up to the fact that, well, actually, there is something going on here. I mean, you look at the tremendous problems facing cities like, particularly Las Vegas has been in the news recently, but all of California, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, and that, of course, will eventually move north. You know, uh, a lot of the American West that was settled is becoming unsettled because basically returning to desert. Yeah, well, there's no question. We, we have uh, terrible water problems in California and the American West. Um, th these things are kind of self-evident right now, although they tend to be regionalized. But uh, the larger point you're making is that uh, we're, we're running into limits with just about everything. There's real, in fact, there's almost nothing that we need or use that you could, that you could list that we're not in trouble with. We're, tr we're in trouble with ores you know, where we get our minerals from. Uh, the quality of our ores has been declining very, very steeply. So now that, you know, it, to, to get tiny little bits of, uh, you know, useful metals, you have to move mountains of dirt and, and process mountains of rock to get that. Um, that's a problem. The water problem is obviously tremendous. 
and uh, you know we're we're destroying our soils at a great rate uh, in doing industrial agriculture the way we do it, and um, of course the uh, the problem that uh, you know I'm accused of not talking about enough is the population uh, overshoot problem, and you know it's a very it's a sad tragic. A desperate and awful thing to have to talk about. And um, one of the reasons I don't talk about it is that we're not going to do anything about our population overshoot problem. You know, there's not going to be any policy or any protocol, at least not in the USA. And what will happen is that uh, the usual suspects will come in and they'll, they'll do their dirty work, you know, famine, uh, war or violence, um, disease, and, uh, um, you know, these are the, th these are the ways that, uh, population will be managed and it's, it's terrible and, and tragic. Uh, an additional tragic thing is that even in periods of hardship, people still have sex and, and have babies so that the, uh, the population problem is going to, you know, the, we're, we're going to continue to overpopulate the planet long after it becomes obvious that uh, we can no longer support this number of people. So, you know, the way this plays out has a lot of potential for being tragic and ugly. So, uh, you know, I would just agree with you that just in just about every sense of every resource that you can name, we're, we're hitting the wall of limits. And, you know, any of them can really uh, uh, cause us terrible problems. And certainly the convergence and, and combination of all of them uh, is going to lead to things that are uh, very hard to deal with. Uh, the public has a hard time understanding some of the dynamics in this. Um, for example, with the kind of agriculture that we practice, uh, you know, industrial agriculture, there are uh, many inputs. You know, one of them is, you know, oil and, and natural gas based fertilizers and herbicides, et cetera. And we're going to run into trouble with those, of course. But uh, the other biggest uh, input for industrial agriculture is capital. The, these corporate farmers have to borrow immense amounts of money every year. And of course, uh, we're now approaching a, a problem with uh, capital impairment and, and the scarcity of available capital moving into the future. So uh, we can see how this problem with banking and this problem with finance and money is going to start affecting the way that we produce our food. And I don't think that the, the public uh, in the advanced nations really appreciate this kind of dynamic. No, and you mentioned uh, war a few moments ago, and as much as uh, war can be used to uh, provide, especially manufactured wars, can be used to provide a tremendous distraction for domestic populations you know, away from things that are happening closer to home, one of the things I don't think has really been recognized, particularly by the media and reporting this, that a lot of what we're seeing now, these tensions and conflicts are connected to resources. And you can make an analysis that would say, if we take the conflicts of the Arab Spring, that that was actually about ultimately about food and water and other resources, you know, conflicts in Tunisia, you know, where that all started in Egypt, that government can't feed its own population now, Saudi Arabia's importing you know, so much food, Algeria, Yemen, Jordan, on and on and on. And even Iran's experiencing, you know, rising food prices and they're having to subsidize their populations. And this is directly linked to a growing regional water crisis we're talking about again a few minutes ago. Yeah, well, what seems to be happening, though, uh, is even uh, stranger. Uh, and uh, that is that these uh, resource problems that nations and, and groups of people societies are facing are making them crazy and we're beginning to see some extremely crazy behavior on the geopolitical scene for example you know what's been going on in ukraine for the last several months um, it's really hard to understand why any european any western european nation thinks that that it has uh, a benefit from trying to bully russia because where are they going to go to get their gas supply? You know, where are they going to go to get their energy supply? Um, it, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and of course, the, the madness that's going on now in, uh, in the Middle East, and in particular in Iraq, 
you know, just today we got news of the be the public YouTube beheading of an American journalist. You know, the savagery and and barbarism and madness of that kind of behavior that we're now seeing with uh, the Islamic State, as it calls itself, is uh, uh, pretty impressive. So, you know, we seem to be, in a way, politically in a, in a position similar to uh, what we saw in Europe in 1914 at the, the outbreak of the First World War, which, you know, historians still have a hard time accounting for exactly what that war was about. You know, it, it, it didn't really seem to be about anything that was important. It just seemed to be an act of madness, of uh, a continent descending into madness. And uh, of course, the consequences of it were worse than anything that the world had ever seen before. And it demoralized the Western world at the, you know, the outset of the 20th century. So, you know, I, I think that what we're seeing is a lot of craziness. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the craziness started to escalate in the months ahead. And we saw even even weirder things happen. Let's turn to the political scene then, because uh, nowhere is this madness more manifest than there. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on whether it's politicians or whether it's the talking heads that they wheel out, you know, a lot of them economists, for example. To what extent do you think that a lot of these main players really don't get what's going on, what we're facing? Or to what extent do you think that there are behind closed doors people saying we're in a world of shit? What are we going to do? Well, that's a very good question. It's really hard to fathom that our leaders, uh, you know, especially at the highest levels and especially um, not just politics, but in business and in academia, it's hard, it's hard to fathom that they, they can't see uh, what's coming and what uh, the issues that we're talking about um, and that they, that, you know, they're, it's hard to fathom that they that they don't notice the conversation that's going on about these things even on the internet. But um, we have to judge them by their acts and by their behavior. And uh, you know, we see things like the uh, the the leading economists in the world behaving in ways that are completely crazy that uh, seem to suggest that they have no sense of consequence whatsoever. And uh, that may be a kind of madness. It, it may be, you know, it's hard to believe that Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen of the Federal Reserve uh, didn't uh, comprehend the risks and, and the hazards that they uh, were courting with uh, these experimental policies of zero uh, percent interest rates and, and uh, money creation. But um, who knows? Maybe maybe they're dumber than uh, than they appear to be. I, you know, it's hard to imagine that the leaders of uh, the advanced nations don't know what the score is with uh, oil. It's hard to believe that Barack Obama doesn't get how the, the shale oil uh, industry has been operating and, and, and what it suggests about the future of it. Um, he, he has made some statements, you know, Barack Obama said in 2011 that we have 100 years of shale gas. And um, I suppose what happened is that his energy secretary, you know, his, his energy minister told him that, and he, he believed it, and he just took it at face value. Of course, it's not true. Uh, you know, whether he has been informed better since then, we don't know. But, uh, it, you know, I, this may be something that only the historians may be able to sort out. In the meantime... There's just a tremendous amount of irrational behavior, and it, it's very hard to understand why we're doing the things we are. Do you know what? It's like sometimes in more reflective moments, and some of these people, perhaps you know, most of them have got children. You know, I'll look at like innocent little kids playing in the park or something, and I'm saying some of these people are making decisions that are basically looking at the in these kids' eyes, and pardon my friend saying, fuck you. You know, I, how, did, how do you live with that? I think that a lot of this kind of behavior can be accounted for by what I call the psychology of previous investment, which is simply, you know, uh, sunk costs, the 
the fact that we've invested so much of our uh, collective wealth in a certain way of living that we can't imagine letting go of that uh, way of life and all of its uh, infrastructures and and, uh, institutions. And we'll do anything we can to keep it going, including pretending that things are a certain way when they're not. So, uh, you know, that's what this wishful thinking interlude is all about in, uh, Amer- in a, you know, th- this period of American history. Uh, it, there's really a master wish. And that master wish for Americans is we wish we could drive to Walmart forever and that nothing will ever come along and prevent us from doing that. Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to be disappointed about how that works out. And, uh, uh, you know, we've decided to tell ourselves, uh, fairy tales and, um, uh, you know, the consequence will probably be a lot of disorder, disruption, uh, illness, starvation, violence, and, uh, you know, all the usual things that happen in, 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 to humans who misbehave. Now, I'm paraphrasing you, actually, from a talk that I listened to about something along the lines of Americans will elect maniacs who will allow them to keep driving to Walmart forever or tell them that they will allow them to. What do you think the prospects are for, you know, the the rise of the demagogue? I mean, you can look at, uh, say, for example, like uh, someone like Putin in uh, Russia and say that, you know, he's a bit of a strong man. He keeps a lid on that country. Lesser men, if you want to use that term, might struggle with that. But the rise of the demagogue is always a possibility. And I know in, in your some of your fiction, you project off into the future and you see some very dark and dangerous figures arising. And obviously there's a potential for that to really happen. Yeah, I wouldn't call Putin a demagogue at all, of course. He seems to be really the most rational actor among all of the, the leaders uh, in, in Europe and America right now. Um, I wrote a series of books after the long emergency uh, they were novels, and they were set in the post-economic collapse American future, the post-oil American future. The first was called World Made by Hand, and the whole series ended up uh, going by that uh, 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 World Made by Hand uh, uh, title. And uh, the second book uh, was called The Witch of Hebron, and the uh, third one just came out. It's called The History of the Future. And in that Uh, I've opened up the story so that one of the characters uh, leaves the small uh, isolated town in um, upper New York state where where he comes from and uh, goes out into the heartland of America and discovers that it has uh, broken into several uh, uh, smaller nations. And one of them, uh, one of the countries he visits is a, uh, a new breakaway nation called the Foxfire Republic. And uh, it's composed of several mid-southern states. And the leader is a former country singer and TV evangelist, uh, a lady named Loving Morrow, who I like to characterize as Dolly Parton meets Hitler. <laughs> you know, that's been the, the, one of the phrases that I've been using in my writing for the last uh, decade has been uh, corn pone Nazis. You know, because I think that America is uh, quite capable of uh, of generating its own really terrible authoritarian, uh, probably theocratic, uh, maniac political system. And uh, I'm kind of surprised that we haven't managed it already, but uh, I think we may be headed there. Um, So this was my way, this, you know, creating this Foxfire Republic and, and sending one of my characters into it was my way of trying to get uh, readers to feel what it would be like to really be in in a place like that, uh, you know, run by the kind of crazy people uh, like that. Well, I'm sure it's not past your attention, you know, what's happening with, for example, uh, Golden Dawn in Greece, uh, the resurgence of the National Front in France, and the rise, continuing rise of the UK Independence Party uh, right here. Yeah, well, a lot of that does have to do with the fact that uh, the leadership in the West has just been so feckless that uh, the public in each of these places would probably it probably just longs for anybody who pretends to be effective. You know, just just to be effective in itself 
uh, would be seen as a tremendous virtue, even if it was the ability to do things that were terrible. Now, I know that you uh, speak regularly, and I just wonder how you're finding uh, you're speaking public at the moment in terms of cognitive dissonance versus actually you know, getting it. And I'm sure all of your audiences you know, are a spectrum of different outlooks. But I just wonder how you feel that's been changing or progressing over particularly the last few years, you know, since 2008? Well, the, the real change was, or, or the, the real change was that when, when I first started talking to audiences about these problems uh, around the time that I published The Lung Emergency, they were very interested. And uh, after 2008, when we entered this uh, period of wishful thinking, they lost interest and they decided that these problems weren't real and they just sort of went back to playing with their cell phones. And this was particularly striking among the college and university audiences that I visited because they were really tuned out. They, they don't believe that we face any problems and they think that we're all gonna be driving Tesla cars and that we will uh, you know, live our lives on our cell phones and uh, we'll all be hipsters and that everything's gonna be great. And uh, you know, it, it, it's tragic and, and puzzling, and, uh, but uh, uh, th- this seems to be the decision that we've made for the moment. I think that there's great potential for it all blowing apart, and I suppose that it probably will. And when that happens, you know, I think that's when we'll see a lot of real craziness uh, emerge. It's already happening. We're we're seeing we're seeing a certain amount of craziness right at this moment uh, in the uh, the riots that are occurring in uh, the in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri, where uh, a young black guy was shot about ten days ago, and uh, uh, you know the what seems to be going on is that uh, you have a an African American uh, part of the public who pretends to want justice, but really doesn't want justice. They want vengeance. And I don't think that they're going to be mollified by anything uh, in the, that happens in, the, in the, the rather long, slow grinding process of the American justice system. And, and I think that this is one thing that could get out of hand very easily right away in the USA. Oh, I think what you're seeing in, in is Ferguson, isn't it? I believe the the area is so much more than just about the the, the shooting of one black guy. I mean, all the people coming in from outside, and yeah, there's looting. There's always people who just generally want to make trouble. But I think it speaks to something else. I think it's reflecting something else. And in fact, I've thought the same when I've looked at that disgusting spectacle that is Black Friday, which you'll be familiar with. That sure. in in one way, it's kind of like, oh well, you know, a consumerist frenzy is alive and well but i think it, it reflects basically some kind of mental illness or instability some deep-seated um discontent well i agree with you and uh but but e- even in that sense it's probably not what most people think it is you know it's not it's not probably not about uh you know the uh the after effects of slavery you know, it, it has much more to do with what's going on now and the choices that people are making about their own behavior. For example, the choices that this unfortunate young man made about how he was going to act with the police, you know, which uh, apparently ended up with him getting shot in the head. But uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Oh, no, I very much agree with you. I wasn't meaning to infer that it was in any way connected with uh, you know, black history in the U.S. I think it's very much a reflection uh, of, of right now. Just thinking about the point I made about your speaking engagements, um, presentations that you do, I know you've done at at least one TED talk, and I was very curious when I listened to you speak, um, because it seems to me, I've not by any means looked at all the TED talks, I mean, there's hundreds of the things, but that seems to be a sort of a bastion of uh, techno-utopianism in some way. Um, I've seen many, many lectures there that are talking about our bright, shiny future, even in the teeth of everything that we're facing. Yeah, well, they asked me to come there, I think it was about, what, 2006 or something like that. So it was a ways back. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about the organization. I didn't particularly uh, care that much. Uh, They didn't pay me uh, to give that talk. They did buy me an airplane ticket and stick me in a hotel uh, while I was there. And uh, I did meet some interesting people, but 
on the whole, yeah, I I agree with you that uh, Ted is one of the great bastions of techno utopian narcissism in the USA or or techno grandiosity, and they uh, in in many ways uh, embody the kind of uh, wishful thinking neurosis that I've been trying to describe. The last time I spoke with John Michael Greer on here, I know you've, you've interviewed him and you're familiar with his work. I asked him about TED and he said, I won't be asked to give a TED talk. <laughs> I think it might be in the light of what you just said. Yeah, he's really, uh, you know, he's, he's not their kind of guy. And, and uh, they're, uh, you know, they've become kind of like, you know, positive thinking freaks and uh, they don't want to hear uh, any bad news. So he, he's right. He probably won't be invited there. And I, I wasn't invited back. So, you know, they never want to hear from me again either. So <laughs> who knows? James, today we've been talking about three E's, as I said at the top of the interview, energy, environment, economy. We've been talking about your books, The Long Emergency, and, and various others, your fiction and nonfiction. Before we wind up for today, perhaps it'd be useful or uh, instructive to end on a positive note um, uh, if, if that's possible. But one thing I, I see particularly emerging is uh, the relocalization movement, whether it's transition towns or relo- relocalization of uh, food production or even local currencies. And ultimately, if we're going to live at all and have some sort of future, whatever it looks like, then there are actions uh, you know, in the face of uh, the, all the political apathy and the incompetence of our so-called leaders. There are things that we individually can do. Yeah, um, I agree. Uh, you know, I've done them myself. Um, I grew up in the biggest city in the USA, and I moved to a small town in upstate New York. And uh, I think that the action is going to be in the places that are scaled to the resource and energy realities of the future, including uh, the ability to produce a lot of what you need near to where you are. So that the places that exist in a meaningful relationship with uh, food production uh, and uh, water power and resources like that are going to be more successful. And, uh, you know, I made that choice. There are a lot of people who are living in places like Brooklyn, you know, who want to be hipsters. And uh, they'll probably, you know, hang on there until it becomes impossible to live in a place like that. And that's unfortunate. I do think that uh, there's some awareness that's now being expressed in the form of transition town movements and and similar movements. But really what will happen is that, uh, you know, societies are emergent organisms. Uh, They're emergent phenomena. And that uh, our society, Western, Western civilizations will respond to the circumstances they face uh, as, as these circumstances occur and we'll see how they reorganize themselves that, you know, the, uh, uh, emergent things are self-organizing and they, or they self-organize in response to the, you know, that the, the circumstances of their time and place. So as it becomes necessary to do some things, we will, you know, we'll do them. The, The sad part is that not everybody will really make it and not everybody will be able to make these changes and get to the places that they need to be. Not all the place, not all the people who need to get out of, uh, you know, a big unmanageable city are going to get out. Uh, And uh, not enough enough young people are going to develop skills that will be of value in uh, the years ahead rather than you know, developing skills in video game programming and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, we'll, we're going to see a lot of changes, that uh, the economy of the rest of the 21st century is going to be very, very different, and that we'll still be able to find joy and happiness and all of the, you know, the human verities in this economy and society of the future, but it's going to look very different. In closing, James, tell folks about your website. I know you also have a blog, you do a podcast, and if it's not out, it's just about to come out, your new uh, World Made by Hand novel, uh, History of the Future. Yeah, A History of the Future is published by the Atlantic Monthly Press. It's available uh, at all the usual suspects. Um, there's, a Kindle aver- there's a Kindle version, and I think that the audiobook is in the works. My website is www. K-U-N-S-T-L-E-R dot com. I publish a blog once a week 
regularly on time every week. Uh, it's called Clusterfuck Nation. Uh, comes out every Monday before 10 o'clock Eastern USA time. Uh, I publish uh, a podcast generally uh, twice a month. The schedule has become a little bit erratic as I have to you know, get a lot of other work done, but I do get it out a couple of times a month. And uh, I publish some other features on my website, including the uh, beloved eyesore of the month, which is a, uh, a monthly cavalcade of the terrible buildings designed in the world, mostly in the United States. Excellent. Well, James, thank you so much for spending time with us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you, Greg, and uh, give me another call someday. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website. That's LegalizeFreedom.com, Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy, and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.